I just think buying from where you live just makes more sense. In Hawaii, we import an estimated 85 to 90 percent of our food, making us dependent on outside forces. I would love to see that, you know, kind of shift that that percentage to be, you know, more more locally produced. It's better right, because it supports the local industry. I think um, it's good for our economy and for the welfare of our local people. As a community, do we have the desire and the will to change? I don't feel proud knowing that our islands that can produce so much food import so much food. We need to do better. What will it take to build a more sustainable food system? This live broadcast and live stream of Kako, Hawaii's town hall, start now. Hello and welcome to Kako Hawaii's Town Hall, live from the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Multimedia Studio. I'm Ron Mizutani. Hawaii is the most isolated, populated landmass in the world. More than 2,500 miles across the Pacific Ocean from the western coast of the U.S. Now that isolation, combined with man-made and natural disasters and this ongoing global pandemic, confirmed what we've known for decades. Hawaii relies too much on imported food. This dependency contributes to our high cost of living, which further exposes Hawaii's food insecurities. Now, there are more than 7,000 farms across Hawaii. Most are small. In fact, two thirds are less than 10 acres. Our climate is ideal for cattle ranching. Grass grows 365 days a year in some areas. Our aquaculture farms are now thriving. Fish ponds and kalo fields are once again relevant. How do we sustain this momentum and encourage growth? Keep in mind the average age of a Hawaii farmer is 60. Our food producers face additional challenges including land access, limited water resources, the high cost of labor, and regulatory hurdles. There are encouraging signs though. Community leaders are networking, they're collaborating, and they're bringing fresh ideas and strategies to support a new vision for food security. Some communities have adapted ancient ahupua'a, the basic self-sustaining unit that usually extends from the highest regions to the sea with the common goal to put affordable, fresh and nutritious food on our tables. Kako means all of us. We all must help chart the direction for the vision for the future of our food. We want to hear from you. You can email or call in your question. We're also streaming live at pbshawaii.org and on PBS Hawaii's Facebook page. Tonight, our town hall panel includes farmers, fishers, and cattlemen. We have invited nonprofit leaders who are on the front line, actively involved in food distributions. We've had business leaders in here who deeply understand the fragility of our food supply chain. We have experts on the planning and promotion of tomorrow's farmers and food producers. We have policymakers, elected officials, and hunger initiative advocates. Let's start this discussion tonight at Source the people who grow, who raise, and to catch the food that we all eat here in Hawaii. And I start with you, Brenda. Brenda Sunshine joining us. Good evening, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Your thoughts on this topic? Uh, it's been, it's nothing new. We've been talking about this for decades. Is this a right time to address this and find solutions? Hmm. Interesting the way that you say, is it a ripe time? Uh, I think so. I think um, the past few years have been a time of upheaval and clarity in our communities. And we really have a responsibility to the legacy of um, our indigenous food systems and the abundance that uh, was once produced in these islands. You know, I think tonight we're gonna hear a lot about priorities we're going to hear a lot about, uh, is enough being funded? Are we doing the right things? How much do we need to actually grow to even th have this conversation, be realistic? I, I want to turn to a farmer tonight, and uh, we want to invite you to talk about uh, being a, a banana farmer. Uh, and, and, and what's it like to know that the challenges exist, and is enough resources being shared your way? Basically, no, there aren't enough resources. Um, it's pretty easy to grow food in Hawaii. We have an amazing climate. We can grow um, lots and lots of edible things. It's very difficult to have food that people want to buy and to build an economic business off of it. Um, there's always more that can be done. And if we want to create an abundance, it has to be looked at beyond just the economics of it. Because as farmers, we can't have the burden of a catastrophe and having an excess on our backs alone. Yeah, we saw a lot of that uh, actually we talk about farmers who actually plow it back into the field because it makes more financial sense 
than it is to, to harvest if there's no market. And Brian, you talk about uh, abundance. There's been an abundance in money into this state. There's no doubt about it with the COVID funds. You spent a lot of time at the legislature as Hawaii Farm Bureau's executive director. Is enough money going our way when it comes to this effort? Or, and we know it's a minuscule of our, our state's budget. What needs to change? Before I answer that question, Ron, you asked Brenda, is it the right time? Yeah. I think the correct answer would probably be it's about time. Mm. Um, you know, the pandemic did highlight some of the deficiencies and the supply chains and the challenges with food security and with farming here in Hawaii. Uh, it was a banner year at the legislature, so we'd like to applaud the legislature. Uh, agriculture, agriculture-related bills got a lot of support, but many other industries did, and we appreciate that, but we need more. Um, we hear the state's budget for the Department of Ag is less than half a percent. I thought I heard recently it's less than a third of percent, about a third of, of, of one percent. That's very small. So we're looking at more investment into agriculture. Uh, we need money for air, uh, infrastructure, for irrigation, or aging irrigation system, invasive species, for marking, transportation, all those costs associated with farming. Farming is a business. And if we're going to be really serious about increasing our food production and food security, we've got to understand that farming is a business and that's how we need to support our farmers and allow them to continue to farm or, or help them continue to farm so that we can address this food security and ultimately increase food production and agriculture production here in Hawaii. At the end of the day, though, Brian, it has to make financial sense. And, and Senator, I want to get to you because I know you're, you're, you've got a lot of thoughts as a lawmaker, but also as a farmer. And I'm going to get to you in a bit, but from the, from the land, I want to go to the sea. And Eric, Eric Kingma from the Longline Association. Eric, uh, you know, during pandemic, uh, the Longliners, the fishers, they, they, their boats were idle. They sat at the piers uh, for weeks, if not months, until things started to ignite once again. In your industry, what needs to change? Yeah, I mean, I think what needs to change is, is a recognition that the fishing industry in Hawaii is actually the largest food producer. And that recognition needs to happen at the this, you know, elected official level, but also the, the community level. Um, you know, during COVID, that was a major market shock to the system in terms of commercial fishing. But a lot of fishermen, a lot of local fishermen still went fishing and fed their ohana, their community, which is which is really great about our island state. We have access to amazing ocean resources. And, um, you know, that has to be part of the conversation is the importance of the ocean and its resources, seafood, in um, food resiliency in Hawaii's food systems. And the longline fishery is the largest producer of food in the state. And, and we need to recognize that and support it um, because it's important not only for local residents, um, but also our, our tourism industry as well. So it's really understanding the fishing industry and what it brings to, to Hawaii. Eric, I, I'm going to be a realist just for a second here because I would love to eat opaka paka every night, right? And not everybody can afford, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> high quality, the deep seven, if you will. But this is not about that. This is about other ways that the longliners, the fishers across the industry actually, is, is really pumping money right back into the community, but not reaping maybe some of the rewards that their hard work is doing. Yeah, I mean, I think in the commercial fishing industry, you know, it is, like Brian said, like farming, it, it is a business. And um, the return is, is what you get at the market. And that market can be really impacted by foreign imports, for example. We're, we're fairly lucky in Hawaii that we have this industry. So you say 80 or 90 percent of food um, is generally imported into the state. When you talk about seafood, it's actually about 60 percent because we have a strong fishing industry. U.S. mainland uh, the amount of imports of seafood is about 90%. So the difference is because we're an island state and we have these resources. Um, I think going forward, we do have to support the industry with, um, you know, with infrastructure, but it's really about training and, and really recognition of what it brings to Hawaii. And, and everyone loves seafood. And I just want to um, remember that during COVID, we, were, we had an opportunity when you're at the food bank and provide with a small amount of money 100,000 pounds of fish that fed 350,000 servings to Hawaii's you know, families in need during that time. So we have the resources. We just have to recognize and sustain it uh, for, for long term. Thank you, Eric. Uh, infrastructure. John Morgan, you've been doing this a long time. And with all the respect, sir, the cattle industry has seen its ups and downs, and you've seen it all happen. Uh, but without infrastructure, without, excuse me, slaughterhouses, without the things that we need as cattle, as, as cat ranchers, how do we make this really work where it's worth your time to ranch? And what's, what's, what's the, 
you know, what is the solutions out there to help you? Well, thank you, Ron. You know, the uh, cattle ranching is probably the oldest form of modern agriculture in Hawaii. You know, first cattle were first brought here in 1793. And at one point, if you go fast forward to the 1980s, there was uh, 1.2 million acres of, uh, of pasture, and now there's about 750,000 acres. So it's, it's, it's dwindling. Uh, now most of the ranchers send their cattle to the mainland. There's about 80,000 head of uh, uh, cattle here in Hawaii. I think uh, last, uh, last count, there was about 14,000 that were processed here. There's a great opportunity for processing more, and, and luckily there's investment in the, the two main slaughterhouses, but it's, uh, it would be worthwhile to have one uh, at least available on each island. And so processing capacity is, is important, but also developing the local market. Uh, you know, the DOE is a great opportunity uh, in procurement of, uh, of uh, local food. So there's a lot of opportunities that are, that are here for ranching in Hawaii. I, I do agree with you on that. Uh, Megan, Megan Fox doing us from uh, Kauai this, this evening. Megan, thanks for making the trip over. Uh, from the Malama Kauai, Dur I think what the organization really shined bright, uh, your good work did, was during the April floods in 2018. Uh, you, you proved that community can come together, if not lead the way. In fact, I think Kauai County looked at you folks as the way to get food, literally, to those who were uh, isolated uh, from the rest of the world from Kauai. This needs to be mirrored, and, and, and it can be mirrored, how does that help in the whole food security discussion? Yeah, I mean, Koi is feisty. I yeah. think that's, that's something we're kind of known for. And um, I think it has to do with our mentalities of not necessarily looking at, at government and saying, oh, they're gonna fix this problem for us or um, philanthropy even, you know, even as a nonprofit looking at our funders to solve the problem for us, but really engagement with every single person out there that e if you eat this is your problem you know if you have a refrigerator if you consume food this is this is your problem and you need to get involved and um, we're lucky that our community understands that and I think that needs to be one of our biggest jobs is really making sure that all of our communities are very deeply involved in this issue because it's only going to get larger and more important and it, and it starts at the individual level you know, Kauai did that, and you guys did quite good, did very well, and congratulations to that, and, and hats off to you and your team. And, and it was it was our community. Yeah, you true. Know? But I tell you what, I, I heard the county officials, uh, they were all pointing to each other, Haima State, they didn't know what to do, how to get the food to the families, and it was your group that really did it, and, feed, and fed families, so, you know, lifesavers, life-saving work that you folks did. Uh, speaking of those on the front line, I want to turn to my dear friend, Kristen Albrecht, uh, from the um, beautiful island of Hawaii and the food basket. You've been doing this for many, many years as well. Food distributions, as we saw through COVID, even pre-COVID, you saw it during Kilauea, you saw it during a lot of Hurricane Lane. I mean, you were up and close with the families who needed food. And then all of a sudden, folks who never stood in line before were standing in line. Uh, Food insecurity is a different conversation for everybody. Uh, you know, someday it's a crisis for everyone every day. Yes, yeah. it is. And I can say that we went from pre-pandemic serving 14,000 people a month to serving over 80,000, nearly half our island during the height of the pandemic. So it really is uh, something that affected everybody and people who had never ever dreamed of not having enough to eat or not being able to pay their bills, um, they were in our lines. And you, and you know, and they're very grateful. They didn't know how to raise their hand. They, a lot of families yes. did, and we saw it even on every island, every county. A good work that food banks did, but also just a lot of partners, nonprofits, uh, coming together, and and even the private sector that made it happen. But now we have to think forward. We have to move forward. Uh, we are getting questions already. Uh, I want to jump right into it, and I want to talk about uh, this question from Rebby, uh, from on Facebook. Thank you, Rebby. Money doesn't equal abundance. It uh, equals a system we've been assimilated to oblige. Real abundance is in the people who have knowledge in farming and our ocean, the farmers and the fishermen passing knowledge to provide for oneself and the community. Senator, I want to ask, maybe you address that. It's more of a comment, but you're not only a lawmaker, you are a farmer. Uh, just your thoughts on that. So, you know, um, you know, a lot of the questions that you asked earlier, you know, is, is factual. You know, we've had our challenges. You know, I think uh, one is being a farmer, a uh, native Hawaiian. You know, we have our challenges on Molokai, as you know, 
our challenges of high unemployment and welfare is evident. Challenges of getting pr produce and commodities to the neighbor islands cost-wise. But again, it is a business. Um, we in government, we need to do more. We need to have agriculture back in our schools. We need to teach it. You know, all too often, we choose the life of not to get dirty. It is an admirable job as a farmer, as a rancher. And I think the focus needs to be on food as we saw through the pandemic. You know, people lined up for food, government, community, nonprofits, uh, the bureaus and everybody came together to make sure this community was fed. So we started to look at that. We need to consider where are we now? We're still at the same place we were before in government. Yep. Half a percent of that budget. And if, you know, we and my colleagues have not seen what we saw throughout this past two years, you know, we have a lot of uh, learning more to do. Mm -hmm. For me, it's preaching to the choir. But again, it's also the community that needs to come forward and say, are you guys listening? This is what we need. Do we have those resources? Do we have the educational tools? I mean, even for us to get food into our schools, it needs to be locally grown. It can be, we see it happen. How much help can we put there? It needs to start at government level Very for nice. the outreach. Very well said. Alicia, I'm gonna to get to you in a second because I see you shaking your head, especially when every time the comment comes about community, but uh, Randall Tanaka, Assistant Superintendent, Office of Facilities, DOE. Thank you for being here tonight, Randall. Uh, we heard a couple of comments now about schools and involvement and opportunities there. Uh, the DOE needs the support as well. Uh, it's, it's kind of a catch-22. Is enough money from the legislature going toward this effort? And at the end, is the DOE receiving what needs to be there? It doesn't happen without dollars. Yeah, you know, I think there's never enough money, right? right? So, <clears throat> so that you take into consideration. What the DOE does is fundamentally two things. Feed our, our young children in school and do workforce building, capacity building. <coughs> so the product, our output is really educated kids that can go into the workforce right away. Uh, and, and there's been a, a, a renaissance on these, what we call CTE, technical training programs, and more interest in farming. But farming's a rough business. You know, and, I mean, don't deceive yourself. You know, it, it's a rough business. Um, and what we've got to not only teach in the skill sets, but the economics of farming. Dirt farming is not the end all to everything. We've got to modernize, we've got to look at different ways, and we've seen a lot of different models. I just came from a, a, a trip looking at what is called a centralized kitchen in Carson, Nevada. Um, <clears throat> and they have a, a kitchen facility that's half a million square feet. They serve 357 schools. Right? It is a phenomenal operation and it creates these efficiencies. And it's not only for students. In, in, in tough times, we can, we can ramp up this operation, feed our communities. So but it takes money. Yeah, and, but it, it's not as much as you think. Yeah, it takes, let me, say, let me rephrase that. It takes re rearranging our priorities. I, I think it takes inspiration that, that turns into imagination and entrepreneurship. Without that, uh, all these things don't work. It's not only money. John Moss, I want to ask you, aquaponics, I mean, uh, you know that industry, you've been studying it. Shrimp farming is very big, it's, it's relevant, it's productive. We see different types of now uh, animal farming as well in the ocean. Uh, it can be a export, it, it can be an import. I mean, we can do things with that industry that maybe we're not spending enough energy on. Yeah, no, I, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to bring aquaculture into this con and very important conversation uh, for those who may not know, aquaculture is the fastest growing sector of, of agriculture and more than half the seafood we eat comes from aquaculture. Um, I think the, the value uh, aquaculture products in 2019 was valued at about $83 million here in Hawaii. So it's not a trivial amount of money. Unfortunately, most of that revenue generation came from two sectors that don't really contribute to food security issues here. One is the shrimp broodstock sector that you alluded to where um, Hawaii producers provide disease-free, genetically improved broodstock mom and pop shrimp for export to Asia and Latin America. In 2015, that was a $40 million a wow. year export 
product. It was the number one consumable export out of Hawaii. The other aquaculture sector that generates a lot of revenue is the production of astaxanthins and beta-glucans mm -hmm. by companies like Cyanotech at Nelha on the Big Island. Um, so aquaculture plays a very important role in revenue generation, uh, $83 million in 2019, but <coughs> its contribution to local food production, uh, I think, um, leaves a lot to be desired. And, and uh, we're, we have a beautiful environment for aquaculture. We've got warm, tropical, clean waters. We, we're geographically isolated, which has inherent biosecurity attributes. We have a lot of technical know-how but it's, it's translating those assets into food that we can consume locally. That's the challenge, and I think uh, we need some uh, to temper some of our aspirational goals, but I think the opportunity exists. We eat about 40 pounds per person per year in Hawaii of seafood, as, as was mentioned earlier, but we, Im we import about 63% of that. Wow, see that's... So, so there's a lot of opportunity for growth, um, it's just, it's, it's relieving some of those barriers of enter, entry into the industry. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for correcting me, or aquaculture. Uh, uh, Alicia, I want to I turn to you. Uh, going back to community and also, uh, you know, this, the discrepancies involved as well as um, having, making sure that folks have equal access, having uh, the opportunity to stand in line uh, for quality, nutritious food. Out in Waianae, you have farming out there, yet some of that product that you're Farming doesn't even go to the people of Waianae or the Leeward Coast. What's happening there? What's the misstep? What's happening? Yeah, I think a lot of the produce that gets, um, that is grown in Waianae, it's excellent. I mean, it's beautiful. It shows up in town on high-end restaurant plates. And, you know, when it does show up at the farmer's market, not a lot of people know what to do with it. And it is a little bit more expensive than some of our other farmer's market pro uh, products that come out. So. Um, there's several things that need to happen like we need to start educating our community on what's being grown in our community but also teaching them what to do with this with the stuff that is coming out of our community and that that's that needs to start in the schools and I'm, I'm really happy that we have programs like Hawaiina o Makahu who is connected to Makaha Elementary and they're teaching the kids about you know Aloha Aina and growing their own food and and being able to prepare it and and getting acclimated to the taste of the food that's actually grown in our community um, we do events like Eat Local Challenges that educate our community on stuff that's grown out there, um, teach them how to grow it, how to prepare it. And once they get the buy-in of the taste and how easy it is to prepare, I mean, we've done a, a year where we focus on beets and beet sales quadrupled just as a result of that simple education. Yeah, I mean, and it's not about just eating ulu or, or, or uh, you know, kalo. This is about having a diverse type of product that's going to be attractive to to even I mean when we, when we put together food items sometimes the, the, the bags the kiki before it even gets home they're, they're dumping you know some of the produce behind because that's not what they learn how to eat or the behavior has to change Hunter I want to turn to you because you you, do, you research this you, this is your life pretty much and I know that's much more than that Hunter don't get me it's wrong this. but this is <laughs> I, I, I know the good work that Hunter does uh, as a food systems planner though what needs to be done uh, who needs to be involved, who has to be at the table, and where does it have to start? I think starting with the, to be sure that we're talking about the same things is valuable. Um, when we use the words like food insecurity, yeah. for example, I think there's often a confusion around whether we're talking about food self-sufficiency and the ratio of production to imports in the state or household food insecurity. And because of these confusion of terms, sometimes solutions are also themselves muddled. Right? And so sometimes there's a belief that by increasing agricultural output locally, that household food insecurity will go down. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, that's exper expressed through markets and through social safety nets. So being clear about what it is that we're trying to optimize for is really important. And also important to recognize that these are not new issues, right? I could pull quotes from the 1880s that drop them into an op-ed today about the import dependency and nobody would be the wiser. But there are also some patterns that we can recognize by looking historically, right? So World War I, World War II, all the goods that we used to then export in the belly of a boat, we reoriented to feed ourselves during crisis. And similar that we've done today, even though it wasn't necessarily goods that were leaving in the belly of, the vo in a, of a boat, they were leaving in the belly of a visitor. And so trying to make sure that we're forging relationships that recognize the existing market structures, particularly our dominant 
industry being tourism, that we can look at that as an asset for growing our agricultural industry. But we do need to ensure that we have social safety net programs so that as we grow that local agriculture, we are also addressing household food insecurity. Thank you for clarifying that, because there is a difference in when, we, when you use the word, the word food insecurity. Uh, people have different definitions, and they may think this is something that's maybe for those who have disparities in, in income. And then with this is a whole different conversation when it comes to just food that's produced here in the islands and, and, and what we can do to, uh, something about that. No, I want to turn to you, Kik, Noel Kiku of Lincoln, another researcher. I mean, if, if this is something we've talked about for decades, why can't we solve this? Why, why, why are we still here today? These are great minds all in one room. Why can't we all just get in one room and say, this is, a, this is how we need to go? <laughs> Tough question, I know. Um, I know. Everyone, <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll solve I it right now, Noah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think one of the reasons is there's a lot of problems. Um, there's big problems, you know, and I think the historical threads help to connect a lot of those problems. Um, you know, when you look at our past agricultural industries that have been based on plantation, on exports, we've, we've committed ourselves for two centuries in this direction. And to, to stop suddenly doing large-scale plantation export and trying to change tack to, to building a local food system, you know, we're two centuries off course. It, it's not a quick fix. It's going to take, you know, sustained large-scale investment to, to build out that infrastructure that's missing. Um, and it's not just physical infrastructure. There's social infrastructure, relationships, you know, market connections like, like Hunter alluded to. Um, as well as the physical infrastructure of, of having the processing capacity, the storage, the transportation, um, all of that we've, we've geared towards exports. And so now re-envisioning what, what we can do today is, is challenging, you know, and, and you know, just while I have the stage, you know, I mean, we're going to step back further in that historical thread. Um, you know, the, the dispossession of, of native Hawaiians from land is, is when a lot of these breaks from food security in our islands originally started. And I do believe that that should be part of the conversation of solutions as well. Yeah, but farming is hard work. Uh, visitor industry, not to say it's not hard work because I was in it, but it's not as dirty work. Mm. And even our generation now, they don't want to get dirty. They want to farm but they may not want to get dirty. Uh, I, Denise, I'm going to get to you in a bit because I, there's a lot of things that are overlapping here when I, when I hear about this. But Danielle, I want to turn to you because we talked about disparity in, in, in not only income and access to food. Your, your work with hunger initiatives and this community that, that is, uh, you know, raises their hand every day, it's a different conversation mm -hmm. when we talk about food insecurity, isn't mm -hmm. it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... I, I am passionate about agriculture, and I think that it's important that we keep in mind both ends of the spectrum, you know, ensuring that we're growing food and we're feeding people at the same time. So it's a lot of the things people have already mentioned. What are the systems that connect those two ends? And I've heard a lot tonight about how we need to make more investments in agriculture, how we need to ensure that people are able to grow food, that farming is a business. Um, and that's all true. I think it's also important to acknowledge that there's a lot of farmers out there that are nonprofit. Um, that it's part of their mission to grow food for their community. It's part of their mission to educate the young people or formerly incarcerated adults or Native Hawaiians in general about the importance of the value of food. And so I think when we're talking about the future of food, we have to acknowledge there's a lot of different possible futures of food. And we have to decide what we value as a community. If we want farming to be a business, then we can, we can focus on that. But if we want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, what we really want is to grow a culture around food that values public health, that values Native Hawaiian culture, that wants to sort of lift up people through the use of food and healthy food, then we maybe need to acknowledge that there are lots of different ways to farm and there's lots of different ways to influence what that could look like. That's a very complex topic when you, when you view it from that lens. Uh, and, and really another... We could probably sit here another 90 minutes to talk just about that. Denise, I want to turn to you. Uh, from the agri you, you have a different lens as well. You wear m many multiple hats. <laughs> uh, also working with agriculture, the Food and Wine Festival. You work directly with restaurants as well. And you've seen it firsthand, what the pandemic did. But you also hear from the farmers. You, mm -hmm. know, they, you know their, tr their struggles. You hear of them, and, and as does Brian. I want to throw some uh, information on, on, on the screen here when it talks about the labor challenges and, and the, uh, how 
intensely expensive it is to run a farm, whether it be for-profit or non-profit. It is not an easy business to be in. And when you think about the gross wage rate, uh, how do you stay prof profitable without pl plowing it back into the land, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, well, if you look at farming, it is a it is a very, very tough business. And again, there's two different models, right? There's a nonprofit model. There's also a for-profit model. And I just think that, um, you know, in looking at conventional farming, um, it's, a, it's a tough sell. I mean, we have 7,000 small farms and um, small 7,000 farms, most of them are small. So when we look at moving the needle on food production, I'm looking at not just the small farmers, but also the large investments that are coming into Hawaii. And I think we need to acknowledge and recognize that that is one um, area that um, needs to be acknowledged and needs to be supported. So for example, there are, there is a company called Mahipono on Maui who has taken over 40,000 acres of land that used to be sugar plantation. There's also investments being made in the slaughterhouses by Hawaii Meats and Mr. Vandersloot putting millions of dollars into our slaughterhouse. And then you look at, now we have this new egg farm that I just visited, Waialua Fresh. Millions of dollars have been put into this. It is not local, there are not maybe local companies, but they are employing local people. And if, and if the state itself can only put less than 1% of the budget into agriculture, then we gotta look for other solutions. And I feel that you know those large companies um, can pay, you know, help workforce, can employ our local people, provide food to our local people, maybe at an affordable price. So I think there are many different solutions. I think we have to acknowledge that large farming, even local large farms like Larry Jeffs and Alun Farms, you need scale. So small farms can do it, but again, then they have to work together. You need to create food hubs. It's, it's just different solutions. But I, I wanted to make sure that I acknowledge the fact that there is outside investment coming into farming and we should support it. And that's not a bad thing. No. That's not a bad thing. Joanne Inamasu, for a Director of Office of Economic Development from Maui County, thanks for being here, Joanne. Uh, it has to, it, it almost has, I think it has to, correct me if I'm wrong, it has to start with the governor. And then it has to start with the Department of Ag as well, our legislatures. Who's not hearing the message? Or is it not being heard? Or is it not being communicated correctly? Just your thoughts on that. I think part of it is communication. But there, I think they're spread in so many different ways that the farmers will just keep their, and I think Senator De DeCoit will also agree with this, the, the farmers and the ranchers will keep going no matter what. And they, they will voice their, their concern. And we all know that they need help. And I think we all got to band together, whether it be county level, state level, even federal level, to help us and help our farmers, our ranchers in all different ways to help support them. We go through different issues um, in Maui County and a lot of it has made the news on what our challenges are and we are trying to help our farmers, whether it be at the Kula Egg Park that we manage, the county manages, or in our other farmers and ranchers throughout the entire county. Um, big ranchers, bigger farms, uh, but I think everybody does need to band together, and that's what I've heard this evening. Bigger farms, though, need more water. Yes. And I know Maui County knows all about that. Issue. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, and without water, you know, there's no life, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be farming or just us as human beings. How do, how do we balance that? I think that's a tough one. And, you know, part of it is education as well. There's some science involved on how, how we can deal with that. And that's when all the minds need to come together. We can tell by weather when the cycle will be happening. How do we mitigate that? Is it a matter of um, growing different types of crops? But even if we do, th there's some sacrifices to be made. Uh, when you look at ranchers, they continue to ranch. It's the matter of their feed that is necessary to keep them going. So it, it's, a, it's a hard balance and that's a tough one, but we need to bring people to the table and there's science to it as well. I wanna watch our time because we're getting a lot of questions and I really appreciate this. Uh, Jonathan, I wanna ask you, because a lot of this goes back to land. 
right? And you're shaking your head in affirmation. Uh, Jonathan Schur, uh, Chair of Hawaii State Land Use Commission, you hold different hats as well. I mean, the Oahu Burial Council, you've, you've been, you've been uh, very much involved in, in so many different processes. Uh, but without land, there is no farming, ranching. And without that, you don't have the prices that, are, that can be competitive. I mean, there's so many different elements that have to be in place and prioritized. Just what are you, your thoughts on everything that you've heard so far this evening? So I'm loving the conversation, but I think the part that's, that gets to part of what you're saying that resonates the most with me is that um, there's a certain bias in this conversation that we've had that we're thinking about one model of farming, the individual or the family farmer, and that is one really critical model. There's also the larger corporate model, but then there's also some of the most progressive and amazing things that have happened around Hawaii, have happened around community-driven. There's no privately owned and operated fish ponds as far as I know. It's mostly been communities coming together to take care of these areas. We've seen that in Lo'i and we've seen that in other areas too. And to tie it back to the land part of the question, sometimes that's happening in the urban district, sometimes that's happening in the agricultural district, sometimes that's happening in the conservation district. One of the things to me that, and this goes to something that Noah said earlier is, you know, we've had this plantation mindset for two decades and it's been on the, the land for two decades or two centuries, but it's kind of still stuck in our mind even though the plantations are gone. And in, unless we start to really think beyond the plantation era of what we want our islands to be like and how we want to reside here, it's going to be much harder to answer those questions about how do we feed ourselves. I like that thought. And, and, and you prompted another thought or triggered another thought in my mind <clears throat> when I talk about land. You, you know, we talked a little bit about weather uh, and uh, no matter what side of the fence you're on when it comes to, uh, we're talking about the future of weather, it impacts us no matter what, whether you're a farmer or, or a rancher. As Lord knows uh, without grass, you can't have ranching. Uh, I wanna get to that question in a bit, but Pamela asks to be a farmer, this is more of a comment. <clears throat> On, uh, Pamela on Facebook, thank you, Pamela. To be a farmer, a nonprofit farmer in Hawaii, you need to be a millionaire. Is that true? It feels that way from the many that I uh, have experienced um, indirectly or directly. Um, it's very, very difficult to acquire land, and not just land to step foot on, but land that has good water access, land that has um, the ability to build infrastructure, um, land that has decent access, all these things have to come together and you see these amazing models of these you know, permaculture dreamlands throughout the state and usually, almost always, it's somebody that made money doing something else and this is their, their playground, which is cool. I think there's probably a role in the food system for that, but it's not something that is achievable or a model for you know, a first generation farmer like me to just step into. A follow up to that <clears throat> question from uh, Will from Pearl City says, well, what can we do to encourage younger people to get into ag as a career to improve our food security? Can the UH, can the community college get involved, colleges get involved, offer courses mm -hmm. for students? How do we motivate your generation to, to, to farm? I think that it has to start as young as possible. Um, <coughs> when I was at the university, we had a student farm program for undergraduates, but we also had a collaborative program with Noalani Elementary School in Manoa right next door. And I was always amazed at how the first grade teachers were a little maybe skeptical of whether these first graders would understand these agricultural science concepts and lessons. And the kids were always super interested. They understood everything. And it was no problem to start it as early as possible. Because I think ultimately um, in societies that I've had the fortune to visit, especially in the Pacific, that are very self-reliant in those communities. Um, say example in Papua New Guinea, nobody is a farmer because everybody is a farmer. Because farming is as essential as doing the dishes, mowing the lawn, paying your bills. It's just what you it's do. It's part of life. It's part of life, and we have a, there's a long way to go from that. I think Noah said it best, that it's not just physical infrastructure, but social inf infrastructure and systems that have, we have a long way to go. Ron, I, I agree with Gabe. I think there's a, dis or there has been a disconnect yeah. with our keiki. Um, lack of ag education, something that Hawaii Foundation, Go Farms, many other organizations are, are trying to fill that void right now. And the concern is if we don't, if we don't educate our students are cakey about agriculture and have them understand and support agriculture. 
when they become the next generation of consumers, potential farmers or even policymakers will be in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. They don't appreciate and understand agriculture because there's a disconnect. Um, everything that we're doing, many of us in this room and outside this room that are trying to accomplish, maybe for not in the next generation or two. So it's critically important. Uh, I think the stat is what, 2% of the population in the U.S. farm for the remaining 98%. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to increase that. We need, and, and that's what we advocate for increasing agriculture. Agriculture in Hawaii is such a small industry. It's one of the real, the, the only industries I think that has potential for true growth. And I agree with, with a lot. I mean, Daniela was right. It, it's complex. Yeah. Um, agriculture is extremely complex, and we need all types but, of farms. But we are seeing all types of farming stories. Uh, Brian, are we seeing uh, Randall? I mean, I, I see Lele Hua High School. They're, they're doing their own thing, they're, and and the kids are buying into it in high school. But they're also doing it in the elementary level. You see it out in Waianae. Uh, what more can the DOE do uh, with the funds that are available, or or is that even something that's doable? I, I think you you got to look at from a supply and demand situation, you know, pure economics, right? What does the consumer want? Are we providing for what the consumer wants? One. Secondly, how do we produce that product, right? It's about scale, right? The small guys, unless they're in the food co-op, are not gonna be produced. We serve 20,000 20, breakfasts and 80,000 lunches a day, a day. There is not one operation that can supply our product. So we work, try to work with as many. But the forces of the marketplace, what has happened over these many, many years, is that the forces of the marketplace say it's more efficient to bring the stuff from the mainland, yeah. right? So until we, we rebalance that, okay, and we're on our way to that, right? I don't know of any of my friends that want their kids to be a farmer or a cafeteria worker, right? Because the way we farm today is just not the way to do it. So we're, we're trying to, we're talking about greenhouses, we're talking about more efficient ways, because it's all land, labor, and water. So if we can take care of the water, less water use, take care of the labor use, and use land that is not, you know, every chance a developer gets to snag prime real estate is a, it's up on a block. So we need to kind of rejigger the market, rejigger how we do these things, and educate towards that. I don't know of how many of you have been to Japan, right? right. Every square <laughs> inch they can plant rice, they it's are rice. planting rice, right? And that's a commitment from the, from the country. Right. And that, okay. that, that takes decades, right? It's no, that. I mean, it, it's something that behaviors have to change, how we, yeah. how we even think, how we eat. Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, we, we've heard a lot farming is a business, um, but it's not just a business. Food is not just a commodity. It's essential for life. It's essential for every culture around the world. Every religion is built around the food. Um, you know, and to me, this, and Japan's a great example. It has a culture of food. Right. People are willing to go pay $100,000 for the first bluefin of the year. They're willing to pay five grand for that perfect melon, right? There's a culture of food appreciation. And to me, the solution in Hawaii is the same. You know, we've heard how hard farming is. Who's going to go into that business if it's just the economics? Kids are going to go into that business because they want to make Hawaii a better place, because they want to connect to land, because they want to feed their community. They're going to connect to the values and the culture of food and not the economics of it. I want to ask this question, and this is open to anybody who wants to take a stab at it. Uh, Jacqueline on Twitter asks, as a consumer, I want to buy local, but if the bananas uh, from Mexico cost half as much as the bananas from Hawaii, I'll get the bananas from Mexico. Uh, how, can, how can government, uh, we make local food more affordable? I mean, but is it governor, government's responsibility? I just want to throw that out there. I mean, that's that's an argument that everybody is going to say. So I'll just Milk say is this. cheaper. So I'll just say this, Ron. You know, um, being a farmer on Molokai, um, you know, we raise purple sweet potatoes. Is it cheaper to buy Molokai purple sweet, sweet potatoes or Okinawan white seed sweet potatoes? <coughs> it's a choice. It's a preference that is there. Uh, it is about economics. And what you have to realize in order to, to move this ahead is everybody needs to play a part, even if it's you. Before growing up in school, we used to... We started off growing beans in the milk container yes. and we learned how to recycle. And 
as we started to do that process, along the way, we had complaints. And it was like, my kid coming home dirty. We don't want this anymore. So one is I always like to say uh, that farming needs to be fun. And the many different ways that we have in farming, uh, hydroponics, greenhouses, uh, conventional farming, it needs to be fun. It needs to be taught where it is admirable to do that. But again, to, uh, in regards to what Randy said earlier, you know, the add-on of the impacts also is we need to look at uh, pests and what destroys mm -hmm. those crops. Sure. As you know, we have our challenges with uh, axis steer, and it's been a huge problem. You know, all these uh, add-ons of problems and challenges that we have makes it really difficult. To what point does government get involved? I mean, we provide many different grants. You know, a lot of nonprofits that are out there, um, you know, a lot of us like to talk about growing and, and telling people how to grow it. For many that have been farming for all these years, they've had the opportunity to try and uh, test other things. Yeah. But again, to the different areas that you're going to, you, you can learn it. For us in government, I think what is one of the bigger things is having government internally because we're looking for land, right? right? As you know, Act 90 has been a big issue and the transfer of DLNR lands to the Department of Ag so that we can expand those areas because many different companies or even individuals that want to lease land is very costly. So if those lands are not being used by the Department of Land and Natural Resources and they can be used for farming or ranching, transfer them over. Do not cherry pick in and internally right. we have our problems. How do we see the future of food going forward? And not only, not only land that's sitting idle uh, and not going into ag, but Jonathan, I ask you, how do you safeguard somebody asks land zone for ag use i mean it, it's kind of a we're 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 taking from one but we're not taking it, from another and giving it doesn't make sense it's one of the biggest problems that we face in front of the land use commission almost all the proposed not just urban development but solar farms sure. are going onto our agriculturally zoned lands um i'll just say we're not doing a particularly good job about protecting them right now um the ag district is a very porous thing. The number of special use permits that are being issued for solar farms, which have token amounts of agriculture on them, is significant. And the incremental nibbling, nibbling away of the ag district at the county level is going forward too. We're supposed to solve this through the important agricultural lands law, but what it has done has helped some of the largest landowners, but our small farmers, the 7,000 that we're talking about, barely gives any benefits to those. Chris, I mean, the majority of our farmers, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them are on Hawaii Island. Yes. And, and you have the benefit of, if you will, that some of the other counties don't have. You have that access to fresh produce that maybe Oahu County, Honolulu County does not have. What, what's your thoughts on that? Are, are your farmers being supported enough by government? Do we have to look at government to solve this, uh, to support this? Well, we do a program called Double Up Food Bucks we're the administrators for that statewide. And that has really helped a lot of our small farmers. It brings federal dollars into the local economy and um, allows, we were just talking about that, um, somebody buying Mexican bananas versus locally grown. And this uh, allows a, a low income resident who on SNAP benefits to purchase that, those bananas that are grown here for half price. And so that makes a difference, especially for our small farmers, we're finding it allows them to scale up. So I think that there are some ways that uh, that government money that comes in can really, really benefit us. And we need to bring more of that federal money into the state to help us. Daniela, are we tapping into enough of those federal dollars that exist? Uh, I know the answer to this, but uh, what, what is not being done or who's not hearing that message? Yeah, I mean, the question about what government can do, yes, of course, invest in farming, you know, as a business or as a value system, but we have these existing nutrition programs. We have child nutrition programs. We have the National School Lunch Program. We have SNAP. We have WIC. All of these things are designed to feed people and they bring hundreds of millions of federal dollars into the state that oftentimes are spent and they go right back out. Right. So programs like Double Up Food Box, like the Farm to School program that Randy's spearheading, um, you know, anything, uh, you know, the 
puts uh, dollars into the farmers markets that are SNAP dollars that would have normally been spent at the grocery store on something from somewhere else. Um, those are the kinds of like really beautiful solutions that connect, you know, low income everyday working people with local food that's normally reserved for these farm to table restaurants and whole food shoppers. So making those accessible to everybody is something that only government can do. Um, right now, the way that things are currently set up. And so, you know, all of these child nutrition programs, we need to think of those as a solution and try to make as many pathways to channel as many of those into the pockets of our farmers as we can. Go ahead. So, and, and it's exactly what we need to do. The prime stuff can go to the top end markets. That's great. The farmers will profit from that. But the secondary product, let's say an off sized tomato, we need to be able to make tomato sauce out of it. Right. And that's what the central kitchen concept is about, right? To maximize the farmer's production. So they get some money from it and they're not plowing it under the ground, right? So that's all part of the model. But you know, we, once again, we've got to develop a culture towards that. We need to, we need to market why it's good to buy local product. Right. And I think that's where the investment has to be. And I don't, I, you know, we spend a lot of energy as we should, because we live in Hawaii uh, on, on farming. Uh, but I don't want to only focus on produce uh, and ranching. I mean, our, we have an opportunity to export food as well with aqu aquaculture, uh, with you know, even our own fisheries. I mean, our, our people want our opaka paka, Eric. Is that not true? Yeah, absolutely. And, and local residents eat twice, three, four times the national average per capita in seafood consumption. So we, our culture, a lot of it around food is, is important. Seafood is important. Um, and our fishery, longline fishery, seafood in general in Hawaii, you know, 60 to 80 percent of it stays here actually. And, you know, from my point of view, I'm not all that interested in feeding the mainland. I'd rather have, you know, our fish stay here. And I think the introduction um, to this show of, of the people talking about wanting to buy local um, is really important. And, um, you know, I think my family tries, but Honestly, I buy, we buy most of our food from major corporate retailers. And um, I think that's where there should be some intervention and some incentives on them, tax incentives, maybe an example, to market locally produced food. Put it, you know, provide the incentive to get it out there and have it more accessible to Hawaii residents. John, you know, somebody, uh, Edwina asks on Facebook, beef prices are ridiculous, local beef prices. Why is local beef... 15 to 25 dollars a pound why would i spend that kind of money when i can buy beef for much less or inex more ins less inexpensive well i think uh i'm, I'm not sure where Ed edwina was <laughs> getting her beef <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but I, you know I, everybody has the opportunity to market their own product any way they want and uh and if you and and i think in general and ranching in particular there's there's room for niche markets, uh, uh, but you know, as we all know, you know, if you're going to compete compete on the commodity side, you know, you've got your lower your cost, and uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the uh, a lot of the most of the you know, the cattle that are born and raised here in, in Hawaii end up going to the mainland, and they still are that way because it's really tough to develop a niche market uh, for the grass-fed beef here. Uh, it's it's uh, it's higher cost to produce a slaughter weight uh, cow here in, in, in Hawaii than it is you get more money for each cow if you send it to the mainland. Which is sad because, I mean, we have venison. I mean, uh, Gord, Lord knows you know this. <laughs> but that, that can be uh, a market as well if the infrastructure was in place to support it. You know, it, it can. And, of course, you know, culturally-wise, sensitivity-wise, you know, as we try to have controlled or manage that, you know, when stuff comes before government and legislature and we try to address these things, you know, you do have the cultural sensitivity. Mm -hmm. It's still a gift from the king. Right. But it's also a pest and it's an invasive species that have encroached those farms, those ranches, and so forth. At what point do government step in by say, we need to manage it so we have a healthy herd of venison, we have a healthy herd of cattle, and at the same time being able to apply that to whether it be school meals to the public you know, those things need to be put into consideration because some people will feel, hey, you're taking them from my ice box. So at what point does the message get out to everybody to say, you know, this is something that we can help feed our people, feed the local people. 
you know, like, like the speaker in the back. I have no interest in selling food out of the state of Hawaii because our means was to be local, sustain ourselves. Now the word sustainability, are we truly sustaining ourselves mm -hmm. or is the entity in business? I agree with what Randy says, centralization is huge. Yeah. You know, when you can centralize something, whether it be infrastructure and everybody can use it because we have food safety issues that also encompass this. You don't have repetitiveness of, of buildings here, there, everywhere. You have one central location and we can move food out fast as we possibly can. Uh, any kind of emergency, hurricanes, and so forth, you know, we're able to feed the people that are here first and foremost. And that depends heavily on outside, not just the food, but outside help. But this is where we gotta work together. Everybody has a, has a play in this, an individual, Everybody does their fair part, and we got to learn to work together. That's what it's going to take. You, you said, my, with all due respect, you said something that made me think of a memory. When you said ice box, my kids didn't know what an ice box was. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Refrigerator. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, I please. I wanted just to add a little bit to what Senator DeCoit was offering and, and sharing is when you talk about government supporting, right? Um, the county of Maui just recently passed, uh, we gave, we putting out grant money, $1.5 million to be able to support our sm smaller farms and ranchers with fencing for access deer to protect mm -hmm. their product, whether it be their animals, whether it be their product. But that's a start and we're gonna do this, we're doing it right now, it's going through to be able to execute very shortly. We also have put in money for next fiscal year, starting July 1, again, additional money. Trying to look at mitigation efforts and how we can help on the government side we, I heard here about some education programs, taking it down to the youth, to the elementary school. We have good partnership to our office and funding with the Farm Bureau, as well as with the Farmers Union United. And looking at taking that in, the Farm Bureau, I believe, still does their ag in the classroom, second grade. And that's where things start. They take things home. And you get them early. Exactly. Yeah. And we also help to fund other agencies because the heavy emphasis on agriculture becoming sustainable. Some of the agencies that we help to fund help to teach families how to grow their own. So it may not be the big ranchers or the big farms that you're looking at, but helping individual families try to sustain themselves. Brenda, so. you've been sitting very quietly and respectfully, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, and we're spending a lot of, again, energy on farming. And in a sense, our fish ponds is farming, but at a very different grassroots, labor intense uh, effort. Yet you're doing this all community if in, in many places. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing dollars going your way? Or is this even something that's part of your vision? It's not so much making money. This is about feeding those in the community. Yeah. Um there are a lot of things that resonated um, over the last hour now. Um, and I think what you're saying is right. A lot of the people that are trying to restore the abundance in our Lokoi'a aren't looking to feed the world or even feed all of Hawaii anymore, but they really have a vision of feeding the people in their community, communities again, feeding their ohana. And um, part of that is not just the physical feeding in food, but the spiritual, relationship that we're trying to restore to food and the places that grow food and um, really like Senator was saying the admirable work of growing food um, places like Lokoi'a can reconnect people to their place um, they can be places of healing and hope and I think that like what Daniela was saying too I think that is a central part of this conversation just the value of food to our communities can aquaculture and fish ponds coexist? Are, are, I mean, it, I don't want to pit one against the other, but it's very different ideas, very different concepts, very, very different investments even, uh, and different goals perhaps even. Can they yeah, coexist? I think they have to coexist. I think we need to explore all types of food production systems from the land and the ocean. Aquaculturists have an interesting option unlike terrestrial agriculturists, aquaculture production can occur along the coast like the local IA that can go inland using recirculating systems or it can go offshore. So aquacultures have, have different options on where to grow their aquatic protein. Uh, some of the real challenges for the local IA operators is that 
because they are in the coastal zone, they're very susceptible to climate change. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about increasing water temperature or ocean acidification. We're getting more and more extreme weather events and these king tides are coming in and knocking down the walls. That's one problem and it's very labor intensive to in restore the uh, structural integrity of the local, you know, the, the ponds. That's one big problem. The other problem is the natural recruitment of the ama ama and the, the, the striped mullet and the, the ava, the milkfish that used to come in regularly through natural recruitment. That's been declining for decades. So do we use land-based aquaculture nursery production uh, to help stock the local ia. There's a lot of challenges doing aquaculture along the coast. Inland here in Hawaii, it's too expensive. Land, labor, and electrical costs are too high. So the other option uh, that has mixed reviews, I think, in the public square is offshore aquaculture. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this started in earnest in the early 2000s, uh, growing moi off the Eva coast. There were three cages out in Eva, and my company at the time, Oceanic Institute, was providing all of the fingerlings, hundreds of thousands of fingerlings to stock the, the cages in Eva. There's, there's uh, um, blue ocean Americulture on the Big Island, there's uh, Ocean Era trying to initiate cage culture. So I think the aquacultures have these different choices on where to site their aquatic production, but it still carries with it a lot of attendant challenges for sure. I'm so sorry, but we're getting, we're getting so many questions, and I want to thank our viewers. Uh, Sian asks, are there resources for parents to incorporate food production in the home for their keiki? Uh, yes, please. Sure. Um, I've wanted to respond to this for a while because I hear so much farm to school, which I'm excited. Everyone's <laughs> excited about. Um, we actually started last year a farm to ECE because we said, you know, elementary is too late to start these conversations. Um, mm. And today we were just sending home um, Kahlo grow kits with the kids from a couple of the Hawaiian charter schools. And I think that's an example of um, community-based agriculture in a way where, you know, I've worked with Noah in the past to distribute ulu trees. I think he's probably given out, how many trees, Noah? Like tens of thousands of trees probably <laughs> at this point. Probably at like five or 6,000. Yeah. I mean, it looks like a lot. Getting there. We're getting there. That's pretty good, though. Um, you know, and all these trees, putting trees in people's yards again, especially in our more rural communities, like there's no reason everyone shouldn't have a tree. There's no reason our young children um, shouldn't be eating our local foods and gaining appreciation for them when their tastes are actually developing. Like elementary, they're already like, oh, green vegetables, ooh. You know, if you get them in preschool, then they're like, hey, I like green beans, I like broccoli. They like shaking their own little bag salads, and I think they're making connections with farmers, then it's gonna last a lot longer as a memory for them. And some of that can be value added too, right? I mean, Absolutely. some of those products can turn into other things and we see what happens with chocolate and, and they can be right. used for different things, including rum. Uh, but I digress. <laughs> Not for that. <laughs> <laughs> but Ron, but I'm, in about yeah. half an hour, I'll be right Ron, with you. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you brought up chocolate and <laughs> rum because you know this discussion is about food. Yes. Critically important is agriculture, but agriculture is so much more. Sure. Our cacao industry, our hemp industry, um, rum, vodka, using sweet potatoes and Hawaiian Orchids. varieties of, yeah. of sugar cane and pineapple for um, distillate, you know, pal vodka. So I think maybe we need to revision what our true agriculture goals are and support the growth of all agriculture, increase in all agriculture. I agree, I mean, agriculture. Uh, Dr. Lincoln said the culture, agriculture, that's part of the word, it, it is. I mean, but it's, it is so complex. We need to support all if we're really going to move the needle, not just with food, but for agriculture. We've got to support all of agriculture, big farms, large farms, medium-sized farms. Majority of our farms in Hawaii, you heard it, is small farms. 12% um, of our farms account for 90% of the ag sales here in Hawaii. That, that's from the USDA census of agriculture. That's a huge amount. I think 20% of our 7,300 farms, their annual sales are less than $1,000. Wow. So, so we need to do something. If we're, if we're to be treating agriculture as a business, I think it's important that to, to confront the narrative of supporting all agriculture because the, the playing field for where we now are in a place where billionaires are investing in agriculture, but yet we're gonna try and say that we're gonna also be supporting small operations and that we can do so in the same manner. 
I think is, is fallacious and it's a flattening narrative, right? The idea that the market power of some of these recent investments will not have detrimental significant effects through consolidation on small and family farm operations and even longstanding larger family farm operations is an important thing that needs to be confronted. And if we ever hope to try and bring next generations into this, we cannot be reproducing a plantation type approach where there are industries that come here and work within our lands, work with our, our, our bodies to produce value that then gets extracted to their shareholders or their already overstuffed bank accounts. Yeah. The, why there is would concern anyone, about the large Why would scale. anyone want to join want, that industry? We want scale, but we want to support our small farmers. And I think those efforts for around food hubs is a really critical discussion that we need to have, which can support those small farmers and open up more access to these small farmers because it'll help aggregate, help process market, distribute for the small farmers that maybe didn't have access. You heard Senator DeCoy talk about food safety regulations, all these things, and the economics does come into play. I, I need to argue it, because I don't think any farmer, for profit or non, can survive and continue farming if they're constantly losing money. I, There's I, absolutely I, no way that can happen. The, the bottom line is the bottom line. Even me as a consumer, yeah. uh, Eric said it the same way. I'm, I'm gonna go shop mm -hmm. at a big box, if you will, I won't even say the name, because the milk is cheaper. Uh, do I want, rather do I rather eat drink <clears throat> something local? Of course, but I can't afford it if I can get something less expensive. Uh, go can ahead. I, can I go back and address the banana question? Please, because <laughs> I think that's important. Like the, the Mexico, the double the price Ecuador. banana, Ecuador. Yeah, right? Ecuador, banana. Ecuador and Mexico. Um, <laughs> our bananas taste better. If you have an apple banana compared to a, a dull banana, they are or sorry. <laughs> Regular banana, some non-apple banana. Um, yes. Well, the guy next to you is kind of biased because yeah. you know, he grows bananas, but <laughs> right. but, but you would agree, right? I mean, buying just bananas, all of our crops yeah. taste better. But you know, the the average grocery store pressure. banana is paying that farmer twelve cents on a dollar. Your local food hub, like ours, is paying them seventy cents on the dollar. So you're supporting your local farmers in a much different way, and that big difference on your banana purchase could mean the difference of you having farms and agriculture in your neighborhood or having hotels. What is it worth? But it? will it lower the price? We got to focus on lowering the cost of production for exactly. the farmers. Yeah. That should translate to lower price. I, I don't think there's anybody in Hawaii that would say, "Oh, if the price was the same, import or local, I'm still buying of import." They're buying the local. Jonathan, you're chomping there. I'm chomping for a few reasons. Go ahead. Um, I'm so glad the question came back up. Yes. Because like, sometimes we stare at our navels in Hawaii and we think we're the only people with these problems. Of course not. Um, these are national mm -hmm. tax policies, farm policies, agricultural policies that are making our farmers here less competitive. Mm -hmm. One of the, we have to keep that in mind. We have to not just support local farmers, but we also have to like look at our cousins in the Pacific and the American affiliated islands that are also dealing with these exact same problems mm -hmm. and start to at least bring to the national conversation through our congressional delegation that there's serious local negative consequences from these national policies that value cheap food above other values. Right. Denise, mm -hmm. uh, right off, I'm going to piggyback right, right off. Jonathan says, Chris from Kailua, and thank you, Chris, for the question. Look, I need bifocals. <laughs> Brother, let me borrow yours. <laughs> you see what I did there? Me or Randy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good one. Good one. Uh, thank you, thank you. You, brother. Uh, Chris from Kailua suggests giving tax incentives for businesses, restaurants, grocers that buy and sell local produce. Uh, your thoughts on that? Gosh, I've proposed this many times, but... Uh, you know, we've, we've talked to some of our leaders in the community to try to provide incentives for um, local restaurants, especially on the restaurant side, because I work with a lot of local restaurants, um, to buy local because, you know, restaurants actually will pay, on the food service side, the, the farmer probably will get more for their crop than on the retail side. Most of the, you know, great produce goes to the, the restaurants. And so... If we can incentivize some of these restaurants who, you know, 50% of the food chain is food service, which is restaurants, hotels, convention centers, whatnot, to buy local, whether it's like for every dollar they, they buy local, maybe they get 50 cents back on the dollar, it would help. Um, you know, I've talked to numerous leaders, but we have not been able, I've not been able to convince them. I think, you know, in order for us to, you know, create some kind of demand at that level or even even to keep the conversation going on agriculture and make it 
important for our leaders, our community has to come out and say it's important. I think we have said it's important, but I don't think we're loud enough yet. You know, when we, we talk about um, legislators listening, they're going to listen to the people because they're elected, right? But so are, we need to are, make a little bit more noise. But is it noise or is it coming together noise? Because you can have right. 19 different voices. <clears throat> right. Excuse me. It, it has to be one message and or similar message. You talked about, is it the right time? It is the right time. I've been doing this for years advocating. Brian and I have been in this long time talking about agriculture and agriculture wasn't popular 15 years ago. I was like talking to myself half the time. <laughs> and now we had the pandemic. You know, I had a CSA at one time and people used to complain about the broken tomato in the bag and ask me for a refund where we were really just trying to connect the farmer with the, with the, the pr produce. It was, frustrating this is back in 2019 right before the pandemic we stopped doing the csa because it got so frustrating for me um people didn't really appreciate food and i think this pandemic put a spotlight on how important local agriculture is so it's the right time for us to get behind get all together and start having that conversation with our local leaders because they're the ones that can make a difference. We need infrastructure. I mean, I'm talking about large farms, but I'm talking about large farms because we haven't put infrastructure into small farms. If you're a small farmer and wants to go and lease one acre of land, I don't know where you can do it. You can do it with me at the Hawaii Agriculture Foundation Ag Park, but there are very few landowners that are going to lease one acre, two acre, five acre parcels of land. We want small farmers. We want our kids to grow up to be farmers. We have to make some Hard decisions on how we're gonna how we're gonna get them up that up that chain. So we hey, Ron, yeah, we talked ahead. about incentives for the restaurants, retail, supermarkets, but for the farmers, why don't we just stop <laughs> taxing food, local food production? Mm -hmm. the legislature just passed a bill which will um, exempt the GET for yeah. kalo cultivation, mm. all egg production, all food production. Why don't we do that? I mean, again, lowering the cost of production for the farmer should result in lower costs for the consumers. You know, the tough part, I mean, you cannot just expect the policy makers right. to, okay, we can do that because everybody's scrapping for that dollar. It's not only the farmers, right. it's health services, it's education, it's everybody. But if you think of a big pie, right? Yeah. If you think of a big pie, <clears throat> you're getting a small sliver yeah. of a slice, if you will. So I'm more of a free marketeer, right? The continuum of subsidizing everything doesn't get to a reasonable kind of business, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's the tough decision we have to make, right? There's a romantic notion of farming. It ain't that romantic, right? right? When you're out there busting your okole and tomorrow your crop could be gone. Denise told me this story once about the pumpkins, right? The, <laughs> the fundraiser that they did. And they couldn't get the pumpkins out of the field. They had all the things <laughs> sold. And now what do you do? Right, so uh, I think mentioned if it takes one weather event, yeah, Kilauea, I mean, wipe, wipes out your your mm -hmm. land and, so the, Ron, and your even, crops. Even with like it. that, like how Denise said, you know, the restaurants want to buy, but it's about consistency, right? Mm -hmm. So here, if you don't have the consistency, the schools, we even for them, we looked at it as, okay, can we just focus on one school? Can we have farmers that can just supply these amount of items? Before you would have to supply the entire state uh, education system. So as we try to break those thing down, things down and have people in the right places to have a conversation mm -hmm. such as this, um, you taking, here you having, you know, disagreements, as we can say, big farmers, small farmers, corporations, whatever. Look at what happened to, to little Molokai. Big guy left, prices on supplies of irrigation fertilizer skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Water rates went up. Now they're proposing a water rate hike. You know, all of these things that happened there you just luckily to break even. And, I, and again, farmers ain't farming because most of them think they're gonna make money. They're farming because it's a passion that they've had. It's been generation passed on. And, and when you take a look at the education system, and I asked the question of the FFA kids when they came before the committee, I said, how many of you gonna farm after you guys graduate from high school? Nobody raised their hand. Mm -hmm. They said, we would love to work for a farmer, mm -hmm. yeah. but now be the farmer. And now go at the challenges, which is why I, I agree that nonprofits that are there to help educate as the state supplies uh, different grant and aids, as we also supply putting fences in place to protect our crops. 
uh, and, and ranches, again, how much is enough? Right. We have to all do our part, and again, this is uh, species and insects that, that get the best of us and invasive species that puts a damper on a lot of these. Even, you know, as uh, fishing fishermen, they have their challenges too. As they fish and they try to supply it, they get whacked from the side too. Hey, you guys taking all these resources. Do we want the imports in? Do we want to sustain ourselves? And do we sustain ourselves in Hawaii by supporting all these different entities? With all due respect, though, I think there are some areas where, at least for example, the Leeward Coast, the kids are interested, are they not? I mean, mm -hmm. so what's happening on the Leeward Coast that may not be happening, I'm not going to pick a town because I don't want to do that, but <laughs> what's happening right there, correct there, if you will? Now, there's no right or wrong, but what's happening correct there? I think there's just a lot of access to programs and I think mm -hmm. our community mm -hmm. is rooted. The gener it's, you know, lots of generations who have stayed in Waianae and have been there for a long time and are connected to their land. And so that those values transfer to the kids who are out there and then they're more, you know, willing to go and try out these programs like Mount Organic Farms and, mm -hmm. you know, Hoaaina. Um, it's kind of like the, the ranching community and, and to, to the point earlier in uh, educating kids when they're young, most of the Paniolo are multi-generation uh, Paniolo because that's what they, they grew up and they appreciated it and they loved it. But I'd also like to go back to the Act 90 thing because you know, you've got the supply side, you've got the tax side, but then you've got the land availability and the cost side and uh, in the ranching community. You know, again, the, the, the acreage has dwindled over the years, and, and, uh, and obviously if you can spread your cost and have predictable uh, you know, amount of, uh, of land, you know, you're going to lower your cost of production. And so, you know, that whole idea of getting land, uh, you know, getting it, uh, you know, completed the transfer to the Department of Ag is an important initiative uh, that doesn't cost, uh, quote unquote, the, uh, you know, the, the taxpayer money. You, Almost you, 19 years, Ron. You need a land bank. We've been yeah. waiting yeah. for this land to come over. It's agricultural land mm -hmm. from DLNR, who has a noble mission, but their mission is not agriculture. The Department of Agriculture's mission is agriculture, and they're but better land managers for agriculture. I agree with farmers. I, I agree with you saying there, but it has to stop. So it has to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. You can have all of us in here in this room singing the same tune. We have a new administration coming in in November. Someone needs to get a get a their so, attention. So again, Ron, let, let's talk about th that. You know, what was the first thing everybody says when they come out on opening session? We like double food production. <laughs> How the what? hell do you double food production if you're holding on to land that can be used to make food? Right. You know, that's that's screwed up. You know, look at what lands that we want to keep in conservation. Work with that. Keep it environmentally sound, safe. But those lands that can be used to make food. We need to get our together. Excuse yeah. me. <laughs> we, we really need to get together. And, and you're because even yeah. under ag, I, I mean, you got aquaculture. You know, these go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. and, and by having everybody here tonight, I think this is a good starting point. And hopefully, those that are out there listening do come and support and do start to speak up and say, yeah, we want local food and, and choose to, supp to support local and buy local. Not stand there and go, hey, by the way, that almost a dollar cheaper, I'll, I'll grab that. I think no, you gotta, you gotta put your money where your mouth is. I, I agree, and, but I think also what we measure and what we're angling towards is important, right? If we just focus on doubling food production as a caloric standpoint, right. doubling our output, doubling our consumption, as opposed to focusing on livelihoods mm -hmm. and who actually benefits from the increase of that local production and local consumption, the, without doing so, we might be optimizing for the wrong thing. And we get the, local f the, the food that's produced locally, but the value that we even pay for that food doesn't stay locally. And while it might have some farmers support it, that a bunch of that value has the capacity to then be sucked up and taken away to shareholders elsewhere. So what we optimize for is just as important as Under, how we go I, about measuring. I thought you were going to talk about how do we double from a point where we don't even know where we're starting from. That's a whole like, other what's, issue. What's number, yeah. And what are we doubling? Yeah, right. Are we doubling sales? Are we doubling acreage? Are we doubling the amount of, mm. of pounds of production? So uh, noble goals, and they're great goals, yep. but that what are we trying to yeah. achieve here? I mean, uh, calorie intake is a whole different Ron, topic, right? I mean, Danielle, I want to ask Ron, you. Ron, we don't that. even know what base is. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we can't double what we don't know what base is. Yeah. So, or, so, so, or so that you, is the problem. Even if you know your base, you can say, I went... Yeah. You know, I, if there are three people in the race, oh, I finished third place. 
<laughs> you finish last place. Yeah. So you know the numbers are just you're just throwing numbers around. Nutritious though, nutrition is very important in this conversation, mm -hmm. is it not? It's very important. I mean, we we know that the more you're going to eat closer to the source, you're going to be getting more nutrients, more fiber. It's less processed. It's you know going to be fresher. It's going to have more vitamins. Um, you know, and of course, Native Hawaiians, other Pacific Islanders, and you know, people who have less access to resources tend to be the ones that have worse health outcomes. We just know this statistically. And typically, it's because they don't have access to this fresh, locally grown food. This is a generational problem. It's been going on since, you know, colonization. Um, so we have generations of, you know, build up to try and fix that. And I think, you know, we need to start really investing specifically in those communities. And again, looking at like, what is the value that we're trying to optimize for? Is it just a local food, just to double local food production for um, dollar amount for, to, for shareholders, for farmers, for local businesses? Right. Or is it to make sure that it's getting to people and, and creating better health and just optimizing for, you know, better value. Mm -hmm. so, I think it's all of the above. You know, you can't say one is better than the other or worse than the other. It's all of the above. I see guys loading up gravy on the rice, whack that mac salad, mac salad. and now what? What are you going to tell them? Oh, brother, that's no good for you. So again, yeah, they're going to tell you, you know, mind your own business. This <laughs> or, or you're on false <laughs> <track>. Yeah, <laughs> short left. I want to say one other thing. I think that we've talked about a lot of problems here tonight. Mm -hmm. But I think we should also acknowledge that we've come a really long yes, way. We are again battling generations of, of, of a system that has been optimized against certain people. Um, since World War II, our food system has completely gone to shelf stable products and you know, double, double income households without someone cooking from scratch. We are battling against just all of this. But if you look at, I mean, when I was growing up, and I know here, most schools did not have gardens in them. Now 85% of schools have gardens. It's a whole new ball game. Kids are growing up valuing food in a way that we didn't. Sometimes we need to take a step back and acknowledge the fact that we are battling these generational things, but we have come a really long way. And we have a long way ahead of us. We just have to keep reminding ourselves that we're taking one step ahead of the other. Yeah, and don't you see more homes with gardens in there? My wife and I tried, you know, <laughs> raising carrots, <laughs> not very well. But, uh, but you tried. Uh, but yeah, I tried, you, you know, but, you know, that was during the whole COVID thing. A lot of folks did it yourself and just tried to, to farm with it, even inside their own. We're going to wrap things up very shortly, but Sean, please. Yeah, one, one quick comment. Maybe it would be helpful to reframe this, this collective challenge as reducing food import. And we, a number of us have heard the, the, the quote that if we do reduce food import by 10%, we'll keep in, in state $313 million. This number came out a number of years ago, but maybe instead of talking about doubling production, maybe the focus needs to be on the co collective reduction of food importation into the state. That might be helpful. That's a great point, Ron. Reducing food imports, not only economically and helping our farmers and helping grow ag, but something that we haven't discussed here is it's going to reduce invasive species coming in, hitchhiking and all that stuff, all that food, the 90% of the food that we import. The less we import, the less invasive species. And invasive species is a terrible problem and a costly problem for many of our farmers and ranchers. I think what I, I'd notice too is uh, <clears throat> talk about the wins. And thank you, Daniela, for reminding us about the positive steps we've taken. You know, lowering our foot footprint in ag. Uh, there are ways that people are doing it more creatively, using less water. Resources are so very important. Uh, there are a lot of positive things happening in our community uh, that is addressing this. It's going to take a long time. No, it will it not? Uh, it will. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, you know, and that food importation issue, um, you, you know, we, it's a different story when you look at it categorically, right? You know, seafood, we do pretty good locally. Fruits and vegetables, we do okay. You know, in, in staple carbohydrates, you know, the foundation of our food pyramid, we produce less than 0.4% uh, locally. Um, and so I think there's tremendous opportunities for gains there. Um, and that's where I think our indigenous crops do have a strong role to play. You know, kalo, sweet potato, ulu, um, that, that are grown in oftentimes in ways that, that you know, take some of these environmental um, issues to heart. Um, you know, ulu in particular, I think has tremendous potential as, uh, 
not just in Hawaii, but globally, one of the only staple crops in the world that grows on a tree. Um, trees are more water efficient, they're more nutrient efficient, they're more resilient to climate change, they're more resilient to interannual variations in rainfall. Um, so by utilizing trees, tree crops, you know, producing staples, um, I, I think there's opportunities. I couldn't agree with you more, no. yep. but if you were to ask a child, and this is all where behaviors come back, right? <laughs> you have a slice of watermelon here <laughs> and a slice of ulu. <laughs> Chances are that child's going to grab that watermelon or that orange from Florida or how do you change that? But that's where the ulu co-op is doing a great job. And yeah, I think exactly. somebody talked about the recipes. The recipes. They're educating. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're teaching and they're preparing recipes and they're, they're doing the outreach. And, and Ron, you know, our time at, or your time at the food bank, our relationship, I just looked at some of the food uh, distributions that we're still doing. And it's including a thousand pounds, it seems, every week or a thousand pound plus coming into Honolulu. So there is a desire for ulu, and I think the ulu co-op needs to be commended, supporting a lot of these small farmers and small producers, also helping the industry by promoting this crop that I agree. Give me a ulu. Ten years ago, I'm like, what is this? What do I do with it? <laughs> now there's resources out there, and, I, and I've learned how to prepare. I have ulu in my freezer right now. Good for you. How long been in the can't Why you say that commercial, but do you know it's cool? I get ice cream in my freezer. Yeah. Too, so. so you know, Ron, yes. you know, a lot of it, like even with the Ulu Co-op, you know, yeah. they every year, you know, gave, donated those Ulu trees, and all they really wanted was to spread it around. Mm -hmm. You know, even within the state departments, they actually put recipes out there, you know, so that we would educate people on how to use it. And the more we start to look at other farmers, you know, most times back in the day, farmers would all keep their secrets to themselves. I don't like tell you my secret, take them to the grave with me. Now, you know, you have value added. You have all these other things on yeah. the table. Mm -hmm. They got to learn to work together and say, hey, you know what, maybe if I'll do the farming, you guys do the value adding, and we would run all these different recipe contests mm -hmm. and that we would share those recipes so that people would come in and say, hey, this is really good. What's the recipe? But, you know, if we kind of keep holding close to us on how you grow certain things, you know, it's a setback in itself, yeah? So, you know, collaborative minds need to work together and, and figure these things out. Again, you know, infrastructure is a big key to this, but it cannot be like one guy going to run this thing. You know, it needs to be shared upon, you know, uh, with each other. And, and information shared, you know, up and down the chain. You know, that is a big step in the right direction. We're going to have to wrap this up. But I, I think for us at the DOE, yeah. we're a good starting point because if we can build mm -hmm. the acquired taste for Ulu and, you know, when, when I came, the, the tilapia guys were really leaning on me to put tilapia. I said, oh, brother, we don't eat tilapia, <laughs> right? But, you know, we've taken some time. We've, we've tested uh, breadsticks and we tested the K-12 range and we get good adoption. The only challenge we have is everybody wants to put shoyu on this thing, and we cannot do that, right? For food, but, but but it's going to take. But the wasn't from Kapolama Canal. So. No, no, it was from <laughs> Alawai. Different Alawai Alawai Canal. Uh -huh. Yeah, different, because different gray. Yeah. 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 No, but but yeah, we'll get there. We we need to the we need to be part of the solution, and we're working towards that. I think we all have to ask the question: Where do we want to be in five, ten years? 15, 20 years. I mean, that's going to be part of our legacy. Uh, and I really thank all of you for tonight. I think we could sit here all night and talk story. Um, but I think there's a, some chocolate calling my name. <laughs> or is it that other stuff? Uh, you know, we understand this issue cannot be resolved uh, in a 90-minute conversation. That was not our intent this evening. Our goal was to bring together these different voices and different perspectives and ideas in one room. Some of us agreed. Some of us didn't agree. And that's OK. And that's part of collaboration. The ideas shared tonight can inspire positive action. And that's what we hope achieve tonight. On behalf of PBS Hawaii's board of directors and our entire staff, we want to thank all of our guests tonight uh, for joining us here in studio. Uh, I know some decisions are tough during these times with COVID, so we thank you for sharing your voices and all of you as well. Lots of questions. I didn't get to all of them, and I apologize. But it is a privilege to be your public television station. It is a responsibility we acknowledge and we embrace, and a mission we remain steadfast in our commitment to serve. I'm Ron Mizutani. Until next time.